Behind every complex issue lies a very simple, straightforward explanation, which is wrong. Russia has been public enemy number one over the past few years, and Vladimir Putin has been at the center of all media coverage on Russia. Russia, Russia, Russia. This reminds me of September 1st, 1939, when Hitler invaded Poland. And the decision of one man to launch a wholly unjustified and brutal invasion of Iraq. I mean, of Ukraine. <laughs> and in doing so, the media have Putinized Russia. We live in a time where it is common to look at complex events through the lens of big individual personalities. Putin has constructed his own reality here, one in which Ukraine is actually being controlled by shadowy Western forces. Kind of like the abusive boyfriend who's like, she actually really loves me, but it's her annoying friends who are planting all these ideas in her head. That's why she broke up with me. And it's like, no, dude, that she's she's over you. But Putin is not ready to let go. I what know. the hell's wrong I with you? I love you, Jessica. All right, so Putin as the abusive boyfriend. Um... In the case of Russia, the media's myopic focus on Putin has particularly intensified since the war in Ukraine. But far too much attention has been focused on Putin, and not enough on the socio-political system over which he presides. The mainstream news cycle keeps us stuck in a perpetual present that leaves us without the historical context leading up to the events that they cover. The media turns everything into a spectacle of us versus them. A Marvel movie-like spectacle obsessed with the great men of history, with supervillains and heroes. But focusing all attention on Putin himself is unhelpful for actually understanding the real geopolitical situation. The obsession with Vladimir Putin's persona effectively reduces a complex set of socioeconomic questions to the state of one man's mood, or his moral character. This reductive view is highly misleading and dangerously counterproductive as it distracts us from the real systemic causes and historical events that have shaped Russia's politics over the past few decades. And it really causes people to buy into one-dimensional fallacious narratives about the source of Russia's issues. Vladimir Putin did not create the system which he governs, nor will removing him from the picture fundamentally change the system's core features. Most videos about modern Russia do not tell the full story as to how Russia's political system came to be the way it is. So unlike most videos which fixate entirely on Putin himself, in this video, we will focus on Russia's domestic politics, Russia's socioeconomic system, the nature of Vladimir Putin's regime, and the conditions that gave rise to it. There is a widespread myth held by many Western liberals and conservatives that Putin's reign was a big departure from that of Boris Yeltsin, and things were going just fine and dandy until Putin came in and brought in big government authoritarianism. This lack of historical insight allows one to think that Russia's ills can be blamed solely on the rise of Putin. And of course, this is a very convenient myth to absolve Western countries of any responsibility, because at the time, Western liberal politicians like Clinton and Tony Blair heavily supported Boris Yeltsin and helped him maintain power. Yeltsin supported their neoliberal anti-socialist ideology of privatization, market deregulation, free trade, and the commodification of the commons. But far from destroying Boris Yeltsin's project of neoliberal transformation, Putin in many ways preserved it and extended it. The transition from Yeltsin to Putin is often characterized by Western liberals as a transition from liberal democracy to illiberal authoritarianism. But as we'll see, a little glance at modern Russian history reveals a very different story. Instead, it is more accurate to look at the Yeltsin and Putin administrations as successive stages in the evolution of the same system. First, a rough period of rapid transition under Yeltsin in which the Soviet system was destroyed and a new liberal capitalist economic model was implemented with enthusiastic backing from the United States. Second, this was then followed by a period of stabilization and consolidation under Putin. 
as Russia began to adjust to the capitalist mode of production and stabilize class conflict. Yeltsin's rule in the 1990s was the stage of capitalist counter-revolution, in which the state socialist economy was dismantled and Soviet political institutions were purged. Putin in the 2000s and onward represents the stage of capitalist consolidation and normalization, which aimed to bring order to the instability and crisis of the Yeltsin years, allowing for the new capitalist system to continue in relative stability without the threat of another communist revolution. While words like capitalism, freedom, and democracy are often used interchangeably by Western liberals, in practice, actually existing capitalism is often implemented at the expense of democracy and freedom. Ever since the dissolution of the USSR, the main priority of the Russian state has been to defend capitalism in Russia at the expense of democracy, as seen in the repeated resort to electoral fraud in the 1990s under Yeltsin and in the present under Putin. The authoritarianism that Putin is widely condemned for is not the product of his personal Machiavellian character, or some shadowy KGB conspiracy, but rather it is an integral feature of the system he inherited and continued. Many of Putinism's worst features are rooted in the post-Soviet capitalist order that has been in place since the fall of Soviet communism. From the outset, the implementation of capitalism in Russia took place in a very corrupt and undemocratic way even though it took place under the supervision of American economists and politicians, who we all know love democracy and freedom. The transition to capitalism created a small class of wealth owners overnight by handing out pieces of the planned economy at absurdly low prices. Publicly owned assets were privatized and given to a select few hands. This led to the formulation of a class of oligarchs, in the last years of Yeltsin's rule, oligarchs and big business began to establish more control over the country's political system and key sectors of the country's wealth, such as the petroleum industry. This also included the corporatization of the media, classic parliamentary lobbying, and bribing local and regional governments. The very legitimacy of the Russian nation-state was at risk of being completely controlled by corporations, and the system was so blatantly broken that Russian people had had enough, and they were taking it to the streets. Class conflict intensified, and most Russians had already lost faith in the new system. So Russia needed a competent new face to restore Russian morale, and bring order to the chaotic capitalist system. Yeltsin knew the man for the job. After worsening health and practically going senile due to excessive alcoholism, President Yeltsin could not handle the task of leading Russia through its chaotic situation. So on December 31st, 1991, in his New Year's address, Yeltsin announced his resignation and publicly announced his successor which would be Vladimir Putin, who, at the time, was heading the government as prime minister. Putin was a breath of fresh air for many Russians. For starters, he didn't drink and was well-spoken, unlike Yeltsin, who is perpetually drunk and incompetent. Yeltsin chose this man as his successor because he was determined to do what was necessary to clean up Russia's capitalist system and restore the legitimacy of the Russian nation-state. To prevent the capitalist system from eating itself and to reassert the nation-state, Putin did rein in some oligarchs, who were perceived to be challenging the legitimacy of the state, such as Mikhail Khodorkovsky and a few others. However, Putin's supposed war on oligarchs was by no means a war on capitalism. As he even admitted himself in an interview with Oliver Stone, Putin did not stop Yeltsin's privatizations. <laughs> при которых э, была создана олигархия, и при которых люди в одночасье становились миллиардерами. К утрате э, государственного контроля над некоторыми стратегическими отраслями или к их развалу. Поэтому э, моя задача заключалась не в том, чтобы остановить приватизацию, а чтобы придать ей более, э, более системный и справедливый характер. He just prevented Russia's transition to capitalism from getting out of control by setting stricter regulations that would allow for a Russian capitalism, rather than a Russia colonized by global capitalists with no loyalty to the country. The capitalist class would be allowed to keep their wealth, but they would be disciplined by the state if they tried to use their wealth to control or undermine the state. Putin wanted to keep Russia on a capitalist road, but he wanted to prevent Russia from becoming like many of the post-Soviet countries in Eastern Europe, where most of the wealth leaves the country, and the government's policies are heavily dictated by corporate lobbying. Since the 2000s, the overall number of billionaires in Russia has steadily increased. And as we all know, an oligarchy still exists in Russia today. 
Nonetheless, Putin's initial crackdown on corrupt oligarchs who refused to play by the system's new regulations led to a rapid rise in his popularity. Putin's sustained popularity was largely due to a new strategic alliance between big business, which wanted strong state protection for the property that they acquired in the 1990s, and on the other hand, millions of employees who were tired of constant salary delays and social instability. This necessitated a stronger bureaucracy and army to enforce stricter rules, which Putin brought to the table. Those who have not carefully studied Russia tend to think that Russia's autocratic system emerged under Putin. They assume that Yeltsin was the guy who tried to bring democracy and liberalism, while Putin took away that democracy and brought in a dictatorship. However, as we will see, most of the crony and undemocratic features of Putin's Russia were already widespread under Yeltsin and they created the environment in which Putin came to power. Putin's regime has been called many things. A kleptocracy, a mafia state, an illiberal democracy, and some just call it a dictatorship. Putin is undoubtedly a very powerful despotic leader, but the system of the Russian Federation is not a classical dictatorship in the way that Franco, Mussolini, or Hitler were. While the term dictator may be a bit of an exaggeration, these various labels do emphasize different features of the Putinist regime. Being a police state with an autocratic bent, its suppression of dissent, its hollow performance of democratic rituals such as elections, emptied of any actual democratic content, and its well-documented systemic corruption through the merger of state and corporate power, whereby corrupt leaders use political power to enrich themselves and their allies. All of these features clearly exist in Putin's Russia, but they are symptoms of the system, not the causes of it. They more so describe the consequences of the system rather than defining its essence. And as we will see, these problems did not emerge only after the 2000s. They were present in the 90s also. So what is the Russian Federation actually? Starting with Boris Yeltsin and later under Putin, the political system that took shape in the Russian Federation and countries of the former USSR like Kazakhstan and Belarus was a system that could best be characterized as managed democracy, or controlled democracy, rather than a classical dictatorship. Different political theorists have used different terms to explain the same thing. For example, the Russian political scientist Dmitry Forman uses the term imitation democracy. Imitation democracy, controlled democracy, managed democracy, whatever you want to call it, is basically a system that has a formal commitment to democratic norms and procedures, but with a total absence of actual political alternatives to the current regime. Wait a minute, sounds similar to the USA? Well, that's because it is, but that's another story. And this is not to say that the Russian Federation and the United States don't have serious differences. The main differences being the hegemony of one party versus two similar parties, and the Russian system being far more illiberal, in terms of the absence of civil liberties and checks and balances on the executive branch. For better or for worse, the USA has a Congress that can block the president's agenda, whereas Russia's parliament is virtually powerless. This could be a bad or a good thing depending on whose class interests are being served by the government. Funny enough, the political philosopher Shelton Wallen actually applies the concept of managed democracy to the United States in his book Democracy Incorporated. But this video is not about the United States. In most of the post-Soviet states like Russia, Belarus, Kazakhstan, Azerbaijan, and even Ukraine, with a few exceptions, it remained impossible for the opposition to come to power. And by holding some kind of elections every few years, these regimes were able to put on a democratic facade. Even throughout the escalating tensions with the US and the EU, where Putin was frequently called out for being a proto-dictator, the Russian regime still continued to maintain the appearance of democratic rituals. During the 2018 Russian presidential elections, Putin's rivals were drawn from the parties represented in parliament, and the balloting process itself was largely clean, in that it was free of blatant falsifications and overt administrative pressure on the electors. Putin's desire to appear as the legitimate ruler democratically elected in accordance with the constitution remains unchanged even today, years after Russia's anti-West turn. However, while the democratic process itself is somewhat legitimate, meaningful democratic participation is not, as only opposition groups that pose no real threat to the ruling party are allowed to participate. And if you seriously try to challenge the regime, well, you might find yourself banned from participating, thrown in jail, or worse. But how did Russia's system of managed democracy even emerge? 
How come Gorbachev's dream of becoming more democratic than the West failed so terribly? The system of managed democracy did not emerge under Putin and became a fundamental feature of the Russian Federation from the start. As soon as Boris Yeltsin realized that he could not achieve his corporatist agenda democratically with the will of the people. Contrary to popular belief, Yeltsin did not democratize Russia. Russia was more democratic before Yeltsin and far less democratic after him. It was Gorbachev who democratized the USSR, making it even more liberal than most countries in the West, almost to a fault, to the point where it arguably backfired. Not only were opposition parties allowed to compete with the ruling party, the CPSU, but even overt right-wing anti-communists were platformed on state TV as he pledged to give opposition groups a fair share of representation. Despite that, however, in 1989, the communists still won 87% of the seats in the first free elections held in the USSR. These were the first elections where different political parties had a serious ability to challenge the ruling communist party. Even after Gorbachev's liberalizations, the vast majority of people in the Soviet republics voted for communist candidates. A year later, a nationwide referendum was held in the Soviet Union, asking participants if they supported the continuation of the USSR as an entity. 80% of the Soviet population took part in the referendum, and 76% voted for the preservation of the USSR. The evidence suggests that most people at the time wanted to preserve the Soviet Union, and mainly wanted to reform socialism, rather than abandon it altogether for capitalism. Contrary to popular belief, the USSR never really collapsed at least not in the way the Berlin Wall in East Germany did. The USSR was undemocratically dissolved in a soft coup, one that became more of a hard coup afterwards. Despite the evidence that most people living in Soviet republics didn't want to do away with the Soviet Union altogether and mainly wanted to reform it, Boris Yeltsin, who in 1991 was the president of the RSFSR, the Russian Soviet Federative Socialist Republic, did not listen to the will of the majority. At the time, there was an internal coup among communist hardliners who wanted to overthrow Gorbachev, General Secretary of the Soviet Union, as he was seen to be a weak leader and an existential threat to the future of the Soviet Union. The communist hardliners wanted him out, but this coup failed. Boris Yeltsin, president of the Russian Soviet Republic at the time, used this chaos as an opportunity to undemocratically pull Russia out of the Soviet Union. Yeltsin met with the presidents of the Ukraine and Belarus Soviet Republics, where they signed a document declaring that the Soviet Union ceased to exist without the will of the people. No popular vote, nothing. Following the dissolution of the USSR and the creation of the Russian Federation, Boris Yeltsin heavily concentrated power within the executive branch and took more and more power away from the parliament. Yeltsin even called tanks to bomb the Russian parliament after the communists in the parliament refused to cooperate with his corporatist agenda. Wait, what? The supposedly liberal pro-democracy guy bombed the parliament. Let me explain. So a standoff between Yeltsin and the parliament emerged after Russia's economic situation got significantly worse as Yeltsin implemented free market reforms that privatized nationally owned industries and removed price controls, leading to hyperinflation and unemployment. After the parliament, which was mostly dominated by democratically elected communists, refused to accept Yeltsin's corporatist agenda, Yeltsin then decided to unilaterally and illegally dissolve the parliament. After the left-leaning members of parliament refused to leave the parliament building, Yeltsin then sent in tanks and helicopters to open fire onto the parliament building in order to get the elected officials to submit to his rule. You heard that right. Bombed the democratically elected parliament. 187 people died, and 437 people were injured in the process. And by the way, all of this was done with the support of the USA. President Bill Clinton publicly voiced his support for Yeltsin and his actions. Rather than bringing democracy to Russia, the result was gangster capitalism, at the expense of democracy. After destroying the parliament in October 1993 and consolidating ever more power, Boris Yeltsin and his party elites created a new constitution that essentially vested all real power in the presidency. This consolidated an immense amount of executive state power that would later lay the foundation for the autocratic governance of Vladimir Putin. This shows how Putin's autocratic style of governance is a direct consequence of the system that Yeltsin created. 
Western liberals and conservatives who hold favorable opinions of Boris Yeltsin, but negative attitudes towards Putin, should be viewed with suspicion. Unlike Yeltsin, who at the time was an authoritarian capitalist that served as America's pit bull, Putin was an authoritarian capitalist that ended up no longer bowing down to the dictates of the United States. And Western elites don't like that about Putin. They dislike Putin because he is not their authoritarian capitalist. Furthermore, Boris Yeltsin's re-election in 1996 was secured thanks to the combination of electoral fraud and Western meddling. Many critics call this election the stolen election, as Yeltsin, with the help of the United States, heavily manipulated the election and barely escaped with a victory despite polling in the single digits. And today, Yeltsin still remains the most unpopular leader in Russian history. The newly formed Russian oligarchs in the United States both wanted to prevent the communists from getting back power at all costs. Therefore, it should be clear now that controlled democracy is by no means a new thing in Russia brought about by Putin. Boris Yeltsin, with the encouragement of the USA, paved the way for Putin and set the stage for the undemocratic political system in Russia today. Rather than being a deviation from Yeltsin's system, Putin represents that system's continuation and development. The democratic process was not sabotaged by the communists, but rather by liberals, with the help of the USA, and their true love for democracy and freedom. Oh yeah, Latin America has plenty of experience with that. But many lying liberals and cold warrior conservatives claim that Russia's authoritarian system and Putinism are somehow a product of the Soviet Union. A supposedly ingrained Soviet mentality, which they claim Putin brought back under his rule. Can Russia's ills be blamed on its Soviet past? There is this common narrative that Putin has ushered in a nostalgic return to Soviet times. And by extension, there is a widespread belief in the Western media and Western political science that Russia's ills can be blamed on the lingering legacies of the Soviet past, and that in order for Russia to finally become a normal liberal capitalist country, it must shed off the supposedly remaining vestiges of the Soviet period. The legacy of the Soviet past has been repeatedly invoked to explain Russia's problems such as authoritarianism and bureaucracy. The anti-communist notion that a supposedly Soviet mindset still lingers within Russian society today is summed up in the term Homo Sovieticus, popularized by the Soviet dissident writer Alexander Zinoviev, and taken up enthusiastically by right-leaning Russian sociologists. Behind the ideological narrative of Homo Sovieticus lies the false assumption that Russia's transition to capitalism has been stalled, or even reversed, by the persistence of communism's legacies. But as demonstrated in this video, the actual history shows that this narrative is clearly not true. Not only that, but statism was not something unique to the Soviet Union. As we will see, statism and capitalism are far from incompatible. But while Putin's actions suggest that he has not reversed Russia's capitalist trajectory, the mainstream media still pushes the narrative that Putin wants to restore the Soviet Union. We will analyze whether this claim is true in the next video, which is all about Putin's ideology. Before we get to that, we need to talk about the exact ways in which Putin's capitalist regime differs from Western liberal capitalist regimes. Because while countries like the United States and Russia are both capitalist countries, something is clearly different. During Yeltsin's rule, big business began to establish control over Russia's political system. It was growing closer to what Karl Marx called a dictatorship of the bourgeoisie. A system in which there are seemingly democratic elections, but no matter who wins, the capitalist class wins, because they heavily influence the outcomes of the elections. But instead of merely presiding over a dictatorship of the capitalist class, Putin gradually established a dictatorship over the capitalist class. See, the capitalist class typically prefers an incompetent decentralized government that they can easily manipulate to their liking like the United States, Canada, or many of the so-called liberal democracies in Eastern Europe, where there exist regulatory institutions that appear to be independent from political parties, but still play a structural role in upholding capitalism, and preventing the rise of any political figure who may possibly take away the property of the capitalist class. In other words, Putin inherited an oligarchy from Yeltsin that was almost becoming more powerful than the government itself, and then he transformed it into a more stable corporatist system in which oligarchs could thrive, but at the mercy of state officials, who also gained economic favors in return, both for the state and for themselves. Now, this does not sound like the liberal capitalism that Western bourgeois economists wanted. And while capitalism and state authoritarianism are by no means incompatible, 
The specific nature of Putin's capitalist regime is one that is far older than the Soviet Union, and that style can be called Bonapartism. Unlike the USA, where policy is heavily dictated by corporations and who gets elected to Congress, the Senate, or the presidency depends almost entirely on who gets the most corporate donations, Russian billionaires, on the other hand, do not have nearly the same amount of power over the state. Throughout history, there have been various situations in which there is a capitalist system with clear class hierarchies, but the ruling class loses its indirect control over the state and becomes dependent on it. This system is often characterized by Marxist theorists as Bonapartism. The concept of bourgeois Bonapartism was first analyzed by Karl Marx to describe the political regime of the Second Empire in France, where most state officials and governors were appointed by the emperor, but other candidates not officially aligned with the emperor could participate in parliamentary elections, but they couldn't really pose a threat to the emperor. In this situation, the ruling class were allowed to retain their property, but were forced to fully rely on the emperor in order to defend it, and to preserve the conditions that benefited their economic interests. The Bonapartist regime was established in response to the inability of the property-owning class to maintain control over the working class, and thereby guarantee the longevity of private property after the victory of the 1848 revolution, and the collapse of the limited bourgeois democracy of the Second Republic of France. To give you the gist, Napoleon III, the forgotten Bonaparte, not Napoleon I, his uncle, was elected to the presidency of the Second Republic of France in 1848, and proclaimed himself emperor through a coup d'etat in 1951, when he could not be constitutionally re-elected. What followed was a strong crackdown on political opposition and a major increase in executive power without checks and balances, all of which the bourgeoisie tacitly agreed to, only because they wanted to prevent the transfer of power into the hands of the working class. Even though the bourgeoisie preferred a more decentralized system and were rather uncomfortable with the Bonaparte having so much power that he could easily take away all their property with just a flick of a pen, they supported Louis Bonaparte nonetheless because he preserved France's class society with an iron fist. Bonapartism is often conflated with fascism because while all fascist regimes have a Bonapartist character, not all Bonapartist regimes are fascists. Putin's state ideology, although very conservative, is not actually fascist. Modern day examples of Bonapartist regimes include Taiwan under Chiang Kai-shek, South Korea under Chan Du Hwan, Singapore under Lee Kuan Yew, Chile under Augusto Pinochet, and of course Vladimir Putin today. Bonapartist regimes usually arise when class conflict is at a breaking point, and the ruling class has to rely on excessive state power to quell revolutionary activity, by any means necessary. Although more decentralized countries like the United States use the exact same authoritarian state tactics that Russia does, they aren't at the point where they need a Bonapartist figure commanding the government. Bonapartist regimes are often good at getting things done, and disciplining the bourgeoisie to serve what the state deems to be national interests. But beneath their supposed stability, Bonapartist regimes inevitably face internal contradictions, as relying too much on ruling through hard power is a double-edged sword. It gives the public no convincing illusion of democracy. Plus, the dictatorial figure in Bonapartist regimes is inevitably seen as the one responsible for everything, and will thus be blamed whenever anything goes wrong. This is unlike liberal capitalism, where the spectacle of political opposition is able to create an illusion of serious democracy, and political parties are able to blame each other for not getting things done. Bearing all responsibility, the Bonapartist figure must ensure some level of prosperity, because if the house of cards begins to wobble, then it can fall very fast, creating a power vacuum whereby revolution could occur, for better or for worse. The Russian people have a revolutionary history, and if history is any indication, no regime can last forever. The overthrow of the Romanov dynasty and the sudden fall of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union have continued to haunt the imagination of Russia's rulers. But let's just hope that a Russia without Putin won't be something worse, and that people can learn from the mistakes of the past. At first glance, Putin's Bonapartist regime of centralized state power may seem to be in conflict with the principles of neoliberal free market ideology, which is often thought to be against big government. But despite his Bonapartist character, I would still argue that Putin's regime primarily abides by a neoliberal economic ideology. Contrary to popular belief, state authoritarianism does not actually contradict the neoliberal ideology of marketizing and commodifying all aspects of social life. On the contrary, state authoritarianism can help reinforce neoliberalism. 
After all, the neoliberal ideology that ended up being adopted under Reagan and Thatcher was actually first implemented in Chile under Augusto Pinochet's dictatorship with the help of the CIA and the guidance of neoliberal economists like the Chicago School and Milton Friedman, key pioneers of neoliberal theory. Increased statism is actually a fundamental part of neoliberalism in practice. Neoliberalism is only for small government insofar as it aims to demolish the welfare state and eliminate government policies that hinder corporate profits. Neoliberalism does support big government policies like state surveillance and a totalitarian police force that can help enforce class rule, squash dissent, and prevent the system from cannibalizing itself. To see how Russia under Putin does indeed still subscribe to the neoliberal economic model instilled by Yeltsin, look no further than Putin's track record of economic policy which includes a wide variety of neoliberal measures, such as a new set of labor laws between 2001 and 2004 which significantly reduced workers' rights, new land laws which further turned land into a fully commodified object of purchase and sale, new housing laws that expanded the privatization of the urban economy and Soviet-era socialized housing, and in 2004, the Putin government launched a major austerity program which cut social benefits, pensions, free transportation, and reduced controls on rent and housing costs. Really, for his entire rule, Putin has maintained a neoliberal economic model, emphasizing austerity, very low deficits, less spending on social services, and maintaining a monetarist framework whereby central banks are encouraged to raise interest rates with the supposed goal of low inflation at the expense of higher unemployment, which is quite literally a neoliberal idea that came straight out of the Chicago School and Milton Friedman. In his Oliver Stone interview, Putin even brags about having a far lower debt-to-GDP ratio than the United States. But as we showed in the deficit myth video, this is not necessarily a good thing or something to brag about. Economically speaking, Putinomics could arguably be considered more neoliberal than the USA or Britain, who deficit spend far more. During the pandemic, hardly any economic aid was given by the Russian government, at least in comparison to many European countries that still have aspects of the welfare state. Despite this, some Western economists claim that Putin has deviated from neoliberalism or even capitalism itself just because he nationalized a few Russian industries. But if we take a close look, we can clearly see that Putin's state-owned enterprises operate in a capitalist manner rather than a socialist one. There has been little to distinguish the behavior of these state-owned enterprises in Russia from the privately-owned enterprises. For example, state-owned enterprises like Rosneft and Gazprom are organized like private companies. They are geared primarily to pay dividends to shareholders, of which the state is simply the largest. The supposed statism of Putinomics is far removed from the thinking of Soviet planners, to say the least. Overall, the defining characteristic of the Putin system has been its commitment to defending the capitalist model put in place during the 1990s. There were a few important differences between the presidencies of Vladimir Putin and Boris Yeltsin and it played out in the realm of ideology and rhetoric. Yeltsin, as a dismantler of the Soviet system, could openly embrace the ideology of free market neoliberal capitalism, as he was initiating the anti-communist counter-revolution and Russians did not yet know how bad neoliberalism would be. They thought that market reforms means that they could get the consumer luxuries of capitalism while keeping the benefits of socialism. Putin, on the other hand, had come to power as the guarantor of the system's normalization, Putin had to tap into the unhealed trauma and demoralization that Russians faced in the 1990s, when almost half of the traditional Soviet working class lost their jobs. So while continuing the neoliberal transition aimed at overcoming the Soviet legacy and cementing Russian capitalism, Putin paid lip service to growing Soviet nostalgia and revitalized Russian nationalism, sprinkled with some collectivism. As we will see in the next video, this was a very conservative kind of collectivism, not a communist one. For example, in the 2000s, as the Soviet national anthem was brought back as the Russian national anthem with new nationalistic lyrics, Putin kept on continuing Russia's economic trajectory towards neoliberalism and decommunization. In other words, while the ideological rhetoric and appearance of Russian politics changed, the neoliberal capitalist practices essentially stayed the same. In the next video, we will show how Putin's rhetoric and the state ideology he promotes deviated from Yeltsin and how it became a far more effective form of preserving Russian capitalism. We will also demonstrate how the state ideology that Putin promoted changed over time, in response to fallouts between Russia and NATO, and in response to Russia's growing domestic problems. 
We will show how Putin went from embracing a pro-Western identity and even wanting to join NATO to then taking a more far-right turn towards a conservative, nationalistic identity that openly opposed the West. In that video, we will also thoroughly debunk the widespread narrative that Putin is invading Ukraine because he wants to restore the Soviet Union. Now I would like to thank my Patreon supporters, especially these generous patrons on the screen. If you want to help support well-researched independent content like this, then consider becoming a patron. It seriously helps. Tossing a few dollars a month is not much for most people, but if enough of you are kind enough to do it, it can make a life-changing difference. If you do join, I'll see you in the Discord server. I chat in there all the time. And stay tuned for part two.